Good morning, men. The movie Spartacus was based on a true story, a gladiator slave who led a revolt against the Roman Empire, about 71 B.C. They were successful in a couple of different battles against the Romans, but finally they were overpowered by the Roman legions and they were captured, a thousand slaves. The head of the Roman legion said, Slaves you have been, and slaves again you will be. But you will be spared the painful death by crucifixion, but only if you point out Spartacus to us, for we do not know who he is. You remember Spartacus was played by Kirk Douglas. And after a pregnant pause, Kirk Douglas stepped forward and he said, I am Spartacus. And then another man stood up and he said, I am Spartacus. And then a third man stood up and he said, no, I am Spartacus. And one by one, all of these thousand slave revolters stood and said, I am Spartacus, knowing that they had sealed their fate, the fate of death. What an impressive man Spartacus must have been. We are studying the life of another impressive man, David. And it's not just the, the man that the slaves were following, but also the vision that he had built into their lives that they shared. And David has been doing this same thing with the people, the people of Judah, and also some of the people in the, the whole nation of Israel as well. We're coming now to 2 Samuel, chapter 1. He's going to become king here today. And what I want us to talk about this morning is how to handle setbacks. Because you're going to see in a moment that David has to deal with a number of setbacks. And so we will, uh, we will start out by looking at the setbacks. And then after that, we'll look at how to interpret them. And then finally, I want us to look at how we can use this lesson today to change our own lives. And so the third thing I want us to talk about today is change. Okay, you should be at 2 Samuel chapter 1. 2 Samuel chapter 1. Let's take a look at the story. What's going on here? Saul, in the last chapter of 1 Samuel, has been defeated by the Philistines, wounded mortally, fell on his own sword, and he has died. And Amalekite, who saw all this, has come to Ziklag, where David is hanging with his people. He's just actually arrived there a couple of days before this. And he's come back to Ziklag, and this Amalekite comes and tells David the news that Saul and Jonathan and uh, two other sons of Saul have been killed. And let's take a look at 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11. Then David and all the men with him took hold of their clothes and tore them. There was grief. They mourned and wept and fasted till evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the army of the Lord and the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. There had been a terrible, terrible defeat of the Israelites this Malachite was reporting. It's very interesting. You can't help but wonder... Why is David weeping for the death of his enemy? Interesting question. Why is David weeping over the death of his enemy? And it has everything to do with the way that David believed. He believed that Saul was the Lord's anointed. In fact, you think the president of the United States that you least respected. And think about his death. There would be mourning by all, regardless of how much difference there was in your politics. So this is a head of state 
who has passed away. And there's national mourning. And David, David, no matter even how he felt for himself, as a leader, he knows that he must represent the norm. And so that the nation must weep the death of its leader, even if, well, besides, Jesus did say, love your enemies. Look down at verse 17. David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan and ordered the men of Judah be taught this lament of the bow as it is written in the... Well, he goes on here and writes this unbelievably beautiful lament, a psalm, if you will, to be sung, if you will. And it says in 19, Your glory, O Israel, lies slain on your heights. How the mighty have fallen. Verse 23, Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and gracious, and in death they were not parted. You can read the rest of that. It's a beautiful lament. Now go to chapter 2, verse 1. And I'm going to kind of give away the whole, the whole deal here this morning. Go to chapter 2, verse 1. Put your finger there. And then flip over to chapter 5, verse 1. And this kind of gives away the, the whole deal, the whole story, what's going on here. Chapter 5, verse 1, it says... All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. Now, what you, what you need to know is this is seven and a half years after the verse we're about to read. Seven and a half years after the verse we're about to read, chapter 2, verse 1. It's seven and a half years from 2-1 to 5-1. So, they come to him at Hebron, verse 2. In the past, while Saul was our king, you were the one who led Israel on military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, these are the leaders of Israel, and the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel and you will become their ruler. So it's interesting. All the people in the nation know that David is destined to be king. It's his destiny to be their monarch. Everybody knows this. There's no question about it. So chapter 2. Verse 1 now. Saul has just died. But it says, in the course of time, we don't know how long, David inquired of the Lord. Remember, this is, this is the key to David's life, is that at every major, and for all we know, minor too, it doesn't record everything that David ever prayed about, but we do know that, that at every major juncture where David makes the right decision, he inquires of the Lord. He inquires of the Lord. He prays. That was the key to his life. And he said, Shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah? And the Lord said, Go up. And then David asked, Where shall I go? To Hebron. The Lord answered. And so David went up there with his two wives. Verse 3, David also took the men who were with him, each with his family, and they settled in Hebron. At its towns. So these 600 men, their families, they all move into the land of Judah, into Hebron. Verse 4. Then the men of Judah came to Hebron, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. So David now, at the age of 30, at the age of 17, he received this anointing. Remember, if you were here, he was anointed by the prophet Samuel, the youngest of seven sons, anointed king at the age of 17, and now he's had all of these different travails. He's 30 years of age now, so you know, maybe 17 years old, probably, something like that, plus or minus a couple years when he went out. Well, well he was anointed and then went out and slew Slayed, killed Goliath. So, for something like something like 13 years, he's been a fugitive. For something like 13 years, he's been a fugitive. And now, suddenly, he's the king of Israel. No. He's just the king of Judah. 
There are 12 tribes. Only one tribe has anointed him king. Just one. Quite a setback from what he anticipated happening. Go over to verse 8. Meanwhile, Abner, the commander of Saul's army, had taken Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and brought him over to Maenaim, and he made him king. He made him king, it says, over all of Israel. He made him king over all of Israel. So Saul, it's interesting, <laughs> your enemies are not alone. <laughs> your enemies have allies. Saul had an ally in Abner, and Abner takes one of Saul's sons, and he makes him king. Abner's a very powerful, he's a commander of Saul's army. He's a very powerful man. If you walked into this room, we would think Patton had just walked into the room. A very powerful presence. Verse 10, it says that Ishbosheth, son of Saul, was 40 years old when he became king over Israel, and he reigned two years. Two years worth remembering. The house of Judah, however, followed David. The length of time David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven and a half years. Seven years and six months. Now, from 12 to the end of the chapter, here's what happens. Abner brings his forces. Joab, who is now the top general for David, they meet at a pool. And it's suggested by Abner that they have 12 of the best men from each side fight. So they each pick these 12. They must have been men like Spartacus' slave warriors. And they each took the dagger out, grabbed the other one by the head, and stabbed each other in the side, and all 24 of them fell dead. And then there was an incredible battle that broke out. One of David's had, had a couple of sisters. One of his sisters had three sons. David had three nephews, Joab, Asahel, and somebody else, Abishai. And Asahel is very, very fast. And so he's chasing after Abner, the head of uh, Saul's army. And he tries to dissuade their friends. They know each other. He tries to dissuade Asahel, but he wouldn't be deterred. And so, finally, Abner turns around and thrusts the butt of his spear through Asahel and kills him. And now, his brother, his brothers, are hot after Abner and really want to avenge the death of their brother. But somehow, Abner makes a persuasive speech that must we go on killing each other like this, and they subsist. And then we come to chapter 3, verse 1, and it says this. <clears throat> The war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. A long time. David grew stronger and stronger. The house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. So we see David becomes king, and we see two incredibly big setbacks. Number one, he's not made the king of Israel. He's made the king of Judah. There, there is no union. It's the north and the south. There's a secession that's taking place here. Really, if you think about it, it's, it's, it's Judah that's seceded with David. He's like the south. And then, for the next, apparently, seven and a half years, there is civil war. There is civil war within this nation. Now... Just think about your own life and how often your life turns out like this. You have what you think was a calling, a promise from God for the future. Just like David and all the people thought he was going to be king over all of Israel, be the shepherd of Israel. And you have a dream too. <clears throat> and so you've had a 
a few successes in that direction, and all of a sudden, there's a, you're part of a faction. You're part of a, a family feud that can't seem to get resolved. Or maybe, maybe it's in your church that just when you thought your church was really going to be a force in this community, winning people to Christ, making disciples, there's a splinter group that doesn't like the theology. And so, instead of having your attention focused to reaching out to other people, there's this little feud that's going on inside of the church. Or maybe it's in your business. You have this vision for providing this product and service that would really make the difference in somebody's life. And so now you've been at it for 13 years. Let's say 13 years. And now finally, it looks like it's all coming together. You got the big contract, finally. The one you've been waiting for. You got the big contract. And you step into it. And within a matter of months, all of a sudden you realize that you have this incredible power struggle going on with the vendor. He wants to control you, and this huge setback takes place. Or it could be a friend. How many times have you invested years into building a friendship with somebody, and then you said something... And they become, instead of your friend, they became an adversary to you. So that's, that's the kind of setback that David is going through. And that, of course, is the kind of setback we all go through. And so the question is, you know, how, how do we interpret these setbacks? How, do we, how would, should David have interpreted these setbacks? How should you interpret the setbacks that you had? You, know, you, you, you have questions when you have these setbacks, don't you? Did I, did, I, was, did I hear God right on this? Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I made a mistake. Or maybe, maybe I heard him right, but now I've done something sinful and, and he's withdrawing his favor. Maybe I should just turn back. Maybe I should give up. Maybe I should, maybe, maybe, that, maybe that dream, maybe that vision, maybe that wasn't what I was supposed to be doing after all. And these are honest thoughts. But David never had them. David never had them. So why do we have them and why did David not have them? And that's the key to interpreting setbacks, is to understand what David knew that we don't know, what David believed that we don't believe that caused David to behave the way that we then don't behave. I want us to leave Second Samuel now, and I want us to turn to a psalm, Psalm 71, because this psalm really gives an incredible insight into what David believed. If you want to know what David believed, you want to see his heart, read the Psalms. Read the Psalms. So we want to look at Psalm 71. And what I would like to suggest as we look at this Psalm is to remember that belief determines behavior. Belief determines behavior. There are always reasons for why people behave the way they behave. There are always reasons. People don't always act rationally, but they always have a reason for acting the way that they act. And these reasons deserve consideration. Belief determines how we behave. And so, David believed some things, certain things, that gave him a resolute hope that the vision would be fulfilled. We're going to look at a few of these verses in Psalm 71. Verse 2, Re Psalm 71, verse 2. Rescue me, save me from my enemies, for you are just. 
David was utterly convinced that God was just. There was no doubt. He did not, he did not decide, he did not make an assessment of God's justice by what was going on around him. He evaluated what was going on around him in the context that he believed God was just. Verse 3. Be to me a protecting rock of safety where I am always welcome. Give the order to save me. Give the order to save David believed that God had the power to save him. That God was omnipotent and that God could save him anytime he wanted. All God had to do is say the word and it's done. David believed that with all of his heart. Verse 5, O oh Lord, you alone are my hope. You alone are my hope. David put his hope in no one else. His hope was built on nothing less than Jesus Christ. Right. O Lord, You alone are my hope. I've trusted You, O Lord, from my childhood. I have trusted. His his faith has always been in, in Jesus Christ. In God. In the Christ of prophecy, yes? Jesus Christ, our God. His hope, His trust, His faith had always been in His God. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, We live by faith, not by sight. We live by belief, not by what we see. Belief determines behavior. David trusted. David had the belief. From his childhood, he grew up in a Christian home, maybe, huh? Verse 6, Yes, you have been with me from birth. From my mother's womb, you have cared for me. David believed that God was omnibenevolent, that God had always taken care of him. In Psalm 139, he says, You knit me together in my mother's womb. You saw my unformed body in the hidden place. Every word that proceeds from my tongue, you know it before I speak it. David believed God had this intimate knowledge of his life and it was based on God's love for him. He believed that. He believed that. Belief determines behavior. And then he says, no wonder I'm always praising you. You know, you cared for me since I was in my mother's womb. No wonder. I can't stop praising you. Even with my setbacks. Because of who you are. Because of what I know about you and how you've cared for me. How you've loved me. I can't stop praising you. Verse 7. My life is an example to many because you have been my strength and my protection. He believed that God, God gave him this strength. God was protect. He believed that God was protecting him, even in the midst of all of these setbacks. He believed that God was protecting him, and as a result of that, he said, "My life is an example to many. David is an example to us here today. We're, we're spending weeks, months talking about a guy who's been dead for thousands of years. Why are we doing that? Because his life was an example, and his life was an example because." He believed that God was his strength and his protection. You want to be, somebody could be writing about you thousands of years from now if you would believe that God was your strength and your protection. That is why I can never stop praising you. I declare your glory all day long, verse 9. And now, in my old age, don't set me aside. Verse 14, but I will keep on hoping for you to help me. He's in a setback here. Even his old age, he's in a setback. I will continue to keep hoping in you. Because of his experience with God, and he was able to cling to his hope that God would help him. And then he says, I will praise you more and more. He just, all of his life is a life of praising God. Verse 15, I will tell everyone about your righteousness. All day long I will proclaim your saving power, for I am overwhelmed by how much you have done for me. I am so unbelievably grateful for what you have done for me. I can't keep it inside anymore. I have to tell somebody. Verse 22, 
Oh, no. Verse 20. Oh, look at that. You have allowed me to suffer much hardship, but you will restore me to life again. I believe this. And lift me from the depths of the earth. You will restore me to even greater honor and comfort me once again. I believe this. I believe this. Verse 22. Then I will praise you with music on the art because you are faithful to your promises, O oh God. You are faithful to your promises, O oh God. I believe it. And I am David. And that's how he interpreted his setbacks. And that's how you can interpret your setbacks, too. And here's the big idea for the day. If I want to behave as David behaved, I must believe as David believed. Belief determines behavior. Belief determines behavior. We live by faith. We live by belief, not by sight. We don't let our circumstances determine what we believe. We don't use our circumstances to interpret our Bible. We use our Bible to interpret our circumstances. David understood this. And so he is our model. He is our example. And so, if I want to behave as David behaved, I must believe as David believed. And that's how we bring about change. We don't change our behavior in order to change our belief. Although there is some value to that. But the lasting change, the transformation that we're all looking for, the transformation, the heart transformation, the change comes by changing the way that we believe. We want to behave differently. We believe differently. If I want to behave as David behaved, I have to believe as David believed. Belief. Belief determines behavior. Do you have any true believers out here? True believers that belief determines behavior? One of the things you see in the Psalms is that the more experience you have with your belief system, David, this is David, this is you too probably, the more experience that you have with your belief system, the more believable it becomes. You see, our belief system in the beginning, we take on by faith. Just pure faith. We just make a decision of the will that we're going to believe. But after you've been walking with Christ for a while, and some of you have, some of you are new at this, but after you've been walking with Christ for a while and have experiences like David has had, it's your faith, it's almost, it's almost to a point where after many years, you don't even need faith anymore. You don't even need faith anymore because you, don't, because you know in whom you have believed it. You know you know from experience the reality. And that's where David ended up here. All right, so how can we apply this to change? Change for ourselves. Remember what Ben Franklin said, you can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. So, if you do want to see something change in your life, you're going to have to do something different. And the point here would be that it's not about behaving differently, it's about believing differently. I'm going to give you a little process. A little process. It's so simple. If you, it just so, it's just so simple. It's a process. Just memorize this. Memorize this. If you want to change your life, it just goes like this. Whatever you, whatever you put in will, will change what you believe. And what you believe will change how you behave. And so, the process is Bible belief behavior. Bible belief behavior. 
If you read right, you will think right. And if you think right, you will do right. Bible, belief, behavior. So, become a disciple of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You are becoming, that's why you're here. Be a disciple of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That means you are a learner. A disciple is a learner. A disciple is an adherent to the person and teachings of Jesus. And those teachings are found in the Bible. You want to change your life? It's so fascinating to me. My brother became a believer about nine years ago. And he, he would tell you this too. Nothing happened. Didn't have the desire to be around other Christians. Didn't have the desire to worship God. This nothing happened. But there was a, enough of a sort of a like a two-degree shift that you knew something had happened. It just wasn't it. It wasn't transformation. And then about three years ago, he got involved in a men's Bible study meeting at noon at his church. And he started getting into God's Word, the Bible. And this kid has been transformed. It's the most amazing thing in the world. He's never been married. He's now dating a woman, thinking about getting married, but he's waiting until she comes along to a place in her spiritual journey where, long story there, but his life has just changed. It's changed. He is beginning to behave as David behaved because he has begun to believe as David believed. How about you? How about me? Let's pray. Our dearest Father in heaven, oh God, the setbacks that we have there, it's just so hard, Lord, to accept that we have to do our work while feeling the prick of thorns. And yet we, we see that we can interpret these setbacks differently when we have a, a biblical worldview. When we believe the way that David believed. Lord, we pray that you would help us to do this. Help us to focus on our belief. Not just trying to do the right thing, but to believe the right thing. And Lord, we pray that we would then do the right thing, but because... It is the thing that we most want to do. And we will be praising you more and more. Amen.